السلام عليكم انتم بخير واش ناشتي صح الحمد لله ياك الحمد لله على كل شي حاجه years ago I was given a choice there are 150 villages that surround the Tukal National Park there are villages in El house most of them and there are 40 on the southern border of the Teradan province the National Park Management is in Marrakesh and they're very familiar with the communities in El Haus. In fact, they never met the communities in the municipality of Tukal and Teradent and I said, that's where I'll go. First we went to Aguin and where's this at? And from Aguin we have to pass 70 kilometers of peace on a mountain road. From Marrakesh, it took us 24 hours to get there. Every time we passed, I would see this mountain, which kept family. I would see this mountain, and at the base of the mountains, I'd see this white mausoleum. I couldn't understand or recognize or know what this old white structure was, but I saw that mountain. And I always thought, if we could just terrace that mountain, then the people could build the fruit tree nursery that they want. Why do Moroccan villages in the entire nation, why do they prioritize fruit trees as among the very most important initiatives for them? Because 70% of agricultural land in Morocco generates 10 to 15% of agricultural revenue. 70% of land and only 10 to 15% of revenue because the people are growing barley and corn and it's not meeting their needs and it's not generating the income they need and they want to transition to fruit tree agriculture. Because in Morocco, as you know, there are 13 varieties of fruit trees that grow organically. Walnut, almond, cherry, Lemon, argan, date, fig, al-khair. <laughs> but the people cannot give their land for the two years needed in order for a seed to grow into a sapling. We need to harvest this year. We can't forego our barley and corn until the sapling grows. We need land for a tree nursery. And when those seeds become saplings, we can transplant them from the nursery to our fields. But where do we get land? I saw that mountain. And if only we could terrace it, we can have up to a hectare where the people can grow their seeds. What did I learn was at the base of that mountain? What was in that white structure? It was a Hebrew saint, a thousand years old. There are saints, Muslim and Jewish and Christian saints buried in Morocco. There are 600 Jewish saints buried from Maghrib. And so, we ask the community in Marrakesh, 
if we could have that land? And they said yes. We went to waters and forests. If we could have land for nurseries, and they said yes. We went to the public school systems in different provinces, if we can hand land for nurseries, and they said yes. We went to the Ministry of Youth and Sports, where they're the centers of the protection of children in Morocco, and many of those centers have land, and we asked for that land, and they said yes. From 2000 until today, we've planted three and a half million trees in Morocco. It took us 14 years to plant our first million. This year, we are planting 1.2 million. Now think about this. The High Commission of Waters and Forests has hundreds of parcels of land in the nation. The Moroccan Jewish community has 600. What does that mean? The nation needs a billion trees. It is the law, it is the policy in Morocco that intercultural dialogue, interfaith communication, not just be encouraged, but that, that it results into human development. That's the policy. That we will have our communication and, and discussion and have our faith, different faiths meet together for the purpose of enhancing our livelihoods, improving our education and, our, and health. Now, we're doing it in the case of the nurseries, but it's very, very hard to achieve. The, the, the solidarity in Morocco is its identity. But to translate that interfaith solidarity into projects for the people, that's a whole different level of unity. Friends, it's the law of the land that every municipality of the 1500 in the nation have to create development plans based on people's participation. How did we know that the people wanted trees? How do we know that when we do this in hundreds and hundreds of villages in different provinces, the most common priority is still clean drinking water? How do we know that there are more than a hundred schools in El Haos alone without bathrooms? Because we listen to the people. And we base our projects on what the people identify and prioritize. And that's Moroccan. And that's in the communal charter. <laughs> however, however, it's too rare. Have you, in your lives, been in a community meeting with women and men, and young and old, and people who have land and people who don't, where together you are discussing the future, your shared vision for the change you want. Too many of us have not. So on the one hand, just like on the matter of multiculturalism, we have an exceptional policy. But its fulfillment is not to the level of satisfaction that we need. We have the municipal charter that champions people's participation, but we are not experiencing it enough. Something that we've learned in rural Morocco is that even participation is not enough. If we are involved in decision making, and our minds are not free, and we do not have confidence, and we feel trapped in our relationships, and we don't have the right to even leave our village, as women and girls do not in rural places. How are we able to make the best decisions based on our vision? And what is even vision? 
if we've never been asked what our vision is. And so what we have now begun, begun to do is that even before we talk about participation and decision making in relation to development, we take four days, 32 hours, to deal with the barriers that we carry within ourselves that stop us from visualizing and creating the change that's deepest in our hearts. We have seen too many people vote and go with decisions that we know did not reflect their deepest need. What is it in our relationships, in our relationship with work, in our relationship with money, in our sense of self, and how we view our own bodies that keep us from creating what's most important to us? We need to address those matters before we even consider the most important project for our community. And you know what we learned in that experience? Engaging 800 women in seven provinces, in workshops involving 25 women in each one. Over 90% of rural women with whom we work never heard of Muduwana. Never heard of the codified statutes in the family code intended to liberate and enhance their lives. As imperfect as Muduwana may be, it is still enabling and freedom enhancing. On the other hand, 100% of the urban women in universities all know Muduwana and that the activism that it requires. And one of the essential things we must do is bring urban women to rural women and have them share this knowledge. <laughs> Let's say something about decentralization. It's the first article in the Constitution. The roadmap began in 2008. The charter has been launched last year. Are we seeing the full transference of decision-making authority to the subnational level? Which for him not? If we're talking about people's participation in decision-making, which is required in the municipal charter, then we need to transfer decision-making to the local level, don't we? It's natural. It's Moroccan. And it's not being experienced to the way that's liberating people in order to implement and determine and create and evaluate and benefit from the projects they most want in their lives. And here we are again. Multiculturalism to development, beautiful policy, not experienced enough. The municipal charter requiring us to participate in our own change, we're not doing it enough. Muduana progressive and thoughtful and unknown to too many of us. Decentralization, a Moroccan pathway not enjoyed. Friends, we have been given Baraka Kabira. We have been given something, a huge opportunity. For what? Can you imagine all the neighborhoods and villages in Morocco identifying and creating the action plans with the power and the budgets to implement them? That is the law of the land. It's embodied in the National Initiative for Human Development to fund that. One of the keys that's not enabling us to achieve this Moroccan vision is that we're not trained enough on how to create and facilitate a community meeting to make sure all voices are heard, to create dialogue where everyone can express their priorities onto a map. We can have women create maps, men create maps, and we can see the differences in gender priorities. And those maps, based on a village's inclusive 
ideas becomes their action plan. And there are thousands of such participatory methods. We need to experience them in order to facilitate them. And too many of us have not had that experience. How many municipal council members have I met that are crying out for this? It's not that they don't want to create community meetings based on participatory methods. It's just that we don't know how. So I say this, that none of us know our individual futures, and no nation knows its future. It's unwritten. And we know that there's reason to be concerned. The level of rural poverty in Morocco is deep and the stratification between, between urban and rural is growing. We see entire municipalities without a girl going to school after 11 years old. And yet, that municipality is growing almond. The global prices of almond have doubled in the past 12 years. It could be certified organic, which doubles its price. And the people are still selling at the local sook. They have gold. And it's not translating into their lives. And so if Morocco doesn't achieve its best future, it's not because of its laws. It's not because of its policies and programs. They are progressive. They are empowering. It's because they haven't been applied and manifested into our lives. And that's Domage Kabir. What if other nations see Morocco with Mudouana and multiculturalism and decentralization and participatory methods and they see that it didn't succeed in Morocco? What if nations of Africa and the Islamic world and the Middle East see that? It won't inspire them to take this Maghribi approach, which is beautiful and sustainable. I'll conclude with this thought. We are at a school of commerce and management, of higher education. And so often, we are told that to be entrepreneurial, what is my entrepreneurial idea? What is yours? Friends, what I have come to see is that the most innovative, thoughtful, integrative, productive, efficient, endurable entrepreneurial thought comes when communities identify the projects that's in their heart. Entrepreneurialism is the aggregation of many people's voices, of all people's voices. And basing our budgets and our projects and our actions and our energy on that will unleash not only your power, our power as facilitators, a power that we've never known. But it will unleash the power of the Moroccan people, which is most beautiful. If only every community, in every neighborhood, in every village, in every cooperative, in every association had the chance. Be entrepreneurial. Go to the people and go to the villages. Go to where you are originally from. And remain there and listen there and pursue the projects that they collectively determine. And therein we'll all be set free, inshallah.